So our keynote today is Dr. Hakeem Olashe. He is an internationally recognized astrophysicist, science TV personality, and global science education activist. His research interests span astrophysics, cosmology, technology development, and STEM education. He is currently a Clarence J. Robinson professor at George Mason University and president-elect of the National Society of Black Physicists. He received a bachelor's degree in, in physics and mathematics from Tougaloo College and a master's and doctorate degree in physics from Stanford University. He holds seven U.S. patents and five international patents. Dr. Olashe is passionate about communicating the scientific process and the results of modern science to students and the public. He regularly appears on national and international news networks, including Netflix, PBS, Discovery, National Geographic, and my personal favorite is Outrageous Acts of Science. It's great in the classroom. He is the author of the newly released memoir, A Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Street to the Stars. As the former space science education lead at NASA and chief science officer for Discovery, Hakeem inspires audiences around the world to chase their impossible dreams, fight for what they want, refuse to listen to the naysayers, and reach out and lend a hand to those around them. So please help me welcome Dr. Hakeem Olashe to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. There are a lot of you here. All right. First of all, thank you so much. You solved my impossible life. It wasn't you directly, but it was, you know, your cousins, your fellow teachers. So whenever I speak to uh, groups of educators, I always say thank you because without you, I would have gotten nowhere in life really fast. So I always say, I heard uh, Brandy mention hope. I always say that I made it through life on hope, hustle, and help. So allow me to share my little story with you. But first, for those of you who don't know me, I do some TV stuff, and I'm a serious scientist. So I want to share some of my scientific gravitas with you with a little clip. People in the airbag industry um, told us that what we were trying to do was impossible, and it was a great feeling to prove them wrong seven years later. <laughs> We asked Hakeem to simulate a bicycle accident. All right, here we go. Okay, that didn't work. I did it. <laughs> like I said, I'm a serious scientist. But let me give you a little bit of backstory. That was not supposed to happen. It, it was supposed to be an illustration that you actually had to fall off of a bicycle to set it off but it couldn't handle the shimmy, and so it went off. Another piece of inside information, it comes in different sizes. I was wearing a small. <laughs> My head's probably a large, so. All right, so back to the story of the day. So I have for you what I know you've been waiting for, a plot. Where is it? You know, as I was back there watching Brandy, I was on the screen, I was like, cameraman or woman, if you zoom in on me like that, I'm not wearing makeup. Anyway, here's your plot. And what you see here, how many, oh, are you all STEM educators? All educators, okay, yes, yes, wonderful. So, you know, that tells you how much explaining I gotta do. So, uh, what we're looking at here is different trajectories of projectiles that are all shot off in the same direction, but they have different initial conditions, okay? Uh, uh, excuse me, they have different initial velocities, diff different initial speeds. And what we see is that the initial conditions, the speed and the direction, completely determine the trajectory as well as the final destination. And so that's how deterministic normal life physics works. The initial conditions determines the outcome completely determines the trajectory. But quantum mechanics, the study of the very small, works very differently, right? It's a completely different reality. And what we find is that there is no such thing as deterministic physics like this. What happens is the initial conditions tells you 
the likely outcomes, the possible outcomes, and it's not just one, it's a spectrum. So you'd get five curves like this, but they would all have the exact same initial condition. What they won't have are the same probabilities of occurrence. So let's say, for example, the one with six, does that thing show up on there? The middle one is the most likely outcome. Well, that's what you would see in most cases, right? In, in the real world, you see the most likely outcome most of the time. But there are some crazy unlikely outcomes, right? So if I was to take this laser pointer and throw it to somebody in the uh, audience, the laws of physics tells us that if it were an elementary particle, every possible path between the two of us, the particle would take it. And it would only choose to be in a particular place once it interacts with the macroscopic world, right? So here's the idea. I felt like when I wrote my book that our lives are more like quantum physics than deterministic physics, right? A lot of the outcomes in your life can be traced to your zip code, to the block that you live on, to your address, to the level of education in your family, in your community. But sometimes in quantum mechanics, the most like, unlikely of outcomes occurs, and we call that quantum tunneling. And so let me share with you my initial conditions. Here I am as a four-year-old little boy. That's me, the cute one. <laughs> We're all barefoot. That's my sister, Bridget. And I'm four years old in that photo. And what happens as my life changes drastically? So I was the fifth generation of my family, my mother's side, born in New Orleans. Um, and so what ends up happening is my parents get into a fight and they divorce and we leave. And so just like, you know, everyone else, my story begins with my family and my, uh, you know, and my community around me. So here's a photograph of my father, my mother, and my sister later in life. Look at our hairstyles and tell me what decade that is. Yes, the 80s. All right, so, but that picture from dad is probably 1980. So <laughs> what happens is my father was born in 1933 in rural Mississippi. He dropped out of school when he was nine years old, left home at 13, and moved to New Orleans where he got a job parking cars for 25 cents a day. My mother was pregnant at the age of 16 and dropped out of high school. She was actually a really good student. And she followed in the footsteps of her mother, who had also dropped out of school at 16 after she got pregnant. And as it turns out, my sister Bridget also dropped out of school at 16 when she got pregnant. So I had zero history of scientific or educational attainment in my family. And not only that, it turns out that, you know, when I talk about my early childhood growing up in my family, I gave it a name. You know, when I was writing my book, I was going to make it like a section title, but we didn't. But I called it Crime School. That's supposed to be funnier. <laughs> I know what it is. Y'all tell students all the time, no talking, no laughing, and then you're like, okay, I better sit here silently. <laughs> no, that is not how you succeed in this class. You got to laugh at my jokes and provide cash donations. Okay. I'm kidding, I also accept precious metals and gems and property. So what happens is, uh, when we leave New Orleans, when I'm four years old, we go to South Central Los Angeles, where my first cousins are. Um, my mom's siblings' kids, excuse me, my, yeah, my siblings, that's your brother's sister, right? Yeah, my brother's siblings' kids. And so I had three older male first cousins, and they were all members of this new social club. You may have heard of it, the Crips. And so, <laughs> There I was, four-year-old, and there, there was my older cousins, and, you know, these dudes were teaching me the streets of South Central L.A., and they went on to start robbing banks and worse. And so a couple of them went to prison in the 80s and got out in the early 2000s. One, uh, my cousin Ralph, he he's, lives in L.A. today. If we went to his house, you'd never know he spent the day in prison. My other cousin Chris, while he was in prison, he maintained a drug problem when he left. He went back to Robin Banks, went right back to prison where he is today, right? So this is sort of my pedigree, my crime school pedigree here. Um, but at the same time, I was a little nerd. And I fell in love with books. 
And I fell in love with science television. I used to watch Jacques Cousteau, Wild America, and my sister came home in middle school with this Edith Hamilton's mythology. Oh, man, that was amazing, right? And then, you know, they had the Hercules cartoon. And what happens is after four years of being away from my father, separated, my mother brings me back to the South. And I'm reunited with my dad. Now, my dad, I think both my parents, although they weren't educated, they were both brilliant. And my dad was kind of an entrepreneurial thinker. Our family always had businesses. Because, you know, listen, I'm in Tennessee. Y'all know how it is in the Deep South. You know, if you don't work, you don't eat. So, <laughs> so we were like hunters, farmers, you know, and uh, bootleggers. <laughs> and so my dad, he goes away to the Korean War, comes back, and he takes the business to the next level. He starts an import operation in New Orleans and an agricultural farm business in Mississippi. And if he was alive, he would be tickled pink to know that his businesses are now legal in many Western states. So, <laughs> so when I was brought back and reunited with my dad at eight years old, he immediately incorporated me into his business. So at nine years old, I moved to rural Mississippi, deep in the woods, and you know we're selling a variety of alcoholic beverages. If anything sounds familiar, please, what's that word? Indict yourself. Um, there was Seagram's gin on the bumpy bottle. They call it bumpy head. Y'all guys know that? Yeah? And there was Canadian mist. And my favorite, the quote unquote wine, TJ Swan. Anybody know TJ Swan? Mellow moods, easy nights, those were the flavors. All right. I've never, you know, I've been all over Napa Valley. I have not found <laughs> that particular grape anywhere. But, uh, you know, so here's the crazy thing for me. You know, I have a son now who's 16 years old. So at every age in his life, I can look at him and compare it to my life, right? So at age nine, I would man the store alone, right? The adults would leave. There's like, here's the alcohol. Here are the agricultural products. Handle it nine-year-old Hakeem, and uh, I did. It was normal for me. You know what else was normal? My cousins would pull up. They're like, let's go hunting, cuz. And so they're, they're 11, and I'm nine, and we're walking off into the woods with rifles, shotguns, you know, swinging axes. See, y'all from the South, so you're like, yeah, and? <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere else in the world in the year 2022, they don't even let their kids use a spoon. So, <laughs> you know, that was kind of, ex that would be extraordinary in today. I'll tell you another funny story. And, you know, I ended up, this is going ahead, I ended up in graduate school at Stanford University. And, you know, the housing was in these circles. And in the middle was this grassy area and it was always a big tree. And one day they sent out a memo that said, oh, don't leave your kitchen sliding glass doors open because squirrels will come into your kitchen. You see where this is going, right? <laughs> I thought, let a squirrel come into my kitchen. It's gonna be a one-way trip. But then I thought about it. I was like, what if some of my neighbors saw me cleaning the squirrel? <laughs> They'd be like, it's a psycho. He's like, over here. I know everybody under 40 is like, what are they talking about? All right. So anyway, I come back to Mississippi. And not only uh, am I doing this crime school stuff, but for me, you know, I was amazed by nature, right? I, I love Jacques Cousteau, Wild America. Mississippi was Wild America. So I am just like having an experimental nerd ball, just exploring the woods, exploring the pond, the animals, the plants, everything. Um, and then, you know, I, I, let me, I went to 13 different schools in like my first, I, I moved every year, okay? So just as I'm going through this wondrous time, we move again. And we move to New Orleans, Ninth Ward. And I'm a little latchkey kid by myself. And so a couple of things happen right before we move. The first thing is I get bored and decide to read an adult book for the first time. And I read the book Roots by Alex Haley. And I discover that adult books are the bomb. Comics were good, but man, these things are like a movie in your head. So I decide, I want to read all the books. I know, I've been trying to get my kids to do that. Doesn't happen, you know. I, I, the guy I wrote my book with, Josh Horowitz, he's like, 
how do you get your kids to read? I, I got all these books. I'm trying to get my kids to read. I'm like, man, when you tell me, well, see, that's supposed to be funny again. <laughs> you, guys, you guys know Jerry Clower? Anybody? Ha! <laughs> yeah. When I was a janitor, I ran into him in the elevator. He was staying in the hotel. I would go to the service elevator. The door opens, and he'll be like, wow, you're big in a big red suit. But anyway, I can only tell that story down here. Nobody else knows who Jerry Clower is. So anyway, I read these adult books, and I'm also doing a lot of experiments. And I play with fire a lot, right? So we have gunpowder. We have gasoline. We have kerosene. We burn our trash, right? So it's like, great. So let me tell you one of the things I used to do. And I'm telling you this because you look at me today, and you're like, oh, what a successful professional scientist. But when you look at those students, and they're doing the stupid stuff I'm about to tell you I did, you got to realize that's that scientist. So you know how it is in the country. You know, people are bored sometimes, not a lot to do sometimes. Today, y'all got cable TV and all that, but back in the day. So what I used to do is a lot of people roll their own cigarettes, Prince Albert. And you know, when you're a kid, they make you roll the cigarettes for you, right? So I started rolling the cigarettes for them, right? And then I got this great idea. Because, you know, I used to, used to take a shotgun shell, cut the shots out, right, to make it safe now, then cut out the gunpowder, and then use it for various experiments. And I was like, I know what I'll do. I'll roll it up into one of these rolling papers, put some parsley on each end out of my mom's kitchen, and I hand it to my buddy, and I'm like, fire it up. <laughs> oh, that was hilarious. Do not do that at home. I am a trained scientist, okay? All right. So I fell in love with fire. So when I moved to New Orleans the next year, I had in mind to do a particular experiment. And my experiment was, let me see how high I can hold a flame above the wick of a candle and ignite the wick. And I was literally holding it millimeters above, and the wick would, you know, I'd see how long it would take for it to ignite. But one time, I'm bringing the flame in, and it's several inches above the wick, and the wick ignites. Slide, please. So I was showing this to people around the world and amazing them before the internet. But now with the internet, everybody knows about it. This has been known since ancient times. It's called the jump of the flame. And it turns out that when you blow out a candle, the smoke that rises isn't smoke at all. It's actually wax vapor, and it's flammable. And so I just kept repeating this experiment to understand what was happening. And finally, I saw it. And I was like, oh, man. So that just triggered me to do like all kind of mixing chemicals in the house and all kind of weird stuff. And then I, I'm like, I need something to read. Where are the books? Where are the books? And the only thing we had was the Bible and the World Book Encyclopedias. Now, which one is less intimidating to a 10-year-old? The one in modern English. So <laughs> the Bible would have to wait two years. So I decide to read our set of encyclopedias from A to Z. And I make it as far as E when I run into this dude, Albert Einstein. And my mind is blown. I love nature. I love weird stuff. And they collided massively in the person of Albert Einstein as well as the topic of relativity. So I decided that, oh, I must learn this relativity stuff. And I did everything I could to start learning relativity. Now there was a big problem, though, because you know what the language of science is? Mathematics. And here's another thing. You know what the number one question people ask themselves when they're choosing their major in college is? Yeah. What, what can I choose that will allow me to make some money and take the minimum amount of math, right? So that was from my own uh, polls that I do. Um, and so what ends up happening is I'm struggling to learn this over years, but I'm sticking with it. And then my mom sees the handwriting on the wall based on what's happening with my cousins, and she's like, I'm moving you to the country full time. But right before she did that, that last 16 months, from the age of 11 to 13, I ended up living in nine different households and attending five different schools across three states. And in every household we lived in, my mom would send me to live with friends, family, whatever. I would be abused by the man of the house in some way, usually beating, overworking me. There was one dude, James Davis, who, because I joke a lot, he would tell me I was a fool. So he'd wake me up at like 3 AM and make me read Bible verses about being a fool. Um, and so what happened is I'm also by myself. When I say I moved every year, South Central LA, 
Houston Third Ward, Houston South Park, New Orleans East, New Orleans Ninth Ward. What do all these communities have in common? You might get shot. That was a joke. Y'all are taking this way too seriously. I'm okay, all right, I made it. So, but it's true. They're tough communities, tough neighborhoods. When you're the new kid, you gotta fight somebody, right? You gotta establish yourself in a pecking order. So I began to learn survival skills at this very tough time of life, right? Middle school era, you're going through the transition into puberty. So I learned really quick, oh, it's better for me to intimidate you than you intimidate me. It's better for me to punch you in the face than you punch me in the face. So I put on this armor, right? I put on this armor that I felt I needed to survive, but it wasn't a conscious decision, right? And it was, you know, back in the day, it was like, I'm gonna go for bad. And all I was doing was being a scared little boy trying to protect myself, right? They're out there alone in the world. Um, and so what happens now is finally when I'm in Mississippi, I'm safe for the first time, right? But I don't feel safe. So by the time I'm 16, I'm carrying a gun every day. At the age of 13, I'm going out to juke joints, pool halls, as they say, turning up a bottle of TJ Swan myself, smoking weed every day at 13. By 14, I'm selling weed, right, at school. I got my own business. Um, and so I'm still a nerd, though. And what happens with me is by the time I'm a junior in high school, I have a girlfriend, and she gets, as a gift, this new thing that comes out, a computer. Now, the reason it looks so crappy, because this is the actual computer. And her mom took a photograph of it in their garage in 2018, TRS-80. So let me tell you about this girlfriend thing I just mentioned. So y'all know what we do in the South. You don't date, you court. I went courting. So how did that work? On Sunday, I go to her house. We sit on opposite ends of the couch while the family watches us for three or four hours. Then I go home. So I'm like, why am I sitting here with you when I can go over there in that other room and learn how to computer? Yes, I use it as a verb. And I went and it had a little booklet that taught you the programming language basic. And then I taught myself the programming language basic. So then this phenomenon started to occur in my life. Remember, I said I got by by hope, hustle, and help. Well, help showed up in the form of a couple of professors from the University of Southern Mississippi. By the way, let me tell you about my high school and my middle school in Mississippi, in East Jasper County. First off, all black Heidelberg High School, public, a mile and a half down the road from all white Heidelberg Academy, private. West Jasper, same thing, all white Heidelberg, excuse me, all black Bay Springs, public high school, all white Silver Bay Academy, all right? And when Mississippi evaluated its schools in the early 2000s, every school in the state was given a rating from one to five, with one being the best, five being the worst, right? But let's call it A, B, C, D, F. Four schools in the state of Mississippi got an F. Two of them were my middle school and my high school, all right? So when these professors from the University of Southern Mississippi started thinking, Oh, let's do some outreach to make a difference, to make an impact. Where can we find the most undereducated, disenfranchised, no hope, Heidelberg? So, thank you. <laughs> Everyone else, this is going on your permanent record. Uh, <laughs> and they came to Heidelberg High School and they told us about this thing that we had never heard of called science fairs. And we decided to participate. And I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll program relativity. <laughs> so I win first place in the Mississippi State Science Fair. <laughs> See, it was unexpected. That's the whole point. All right, I, I did it. I, <laughs> okay, all right. So what happens is, don't worry, I only have three more hours to go. So what happens is, the professors who, who, who were judging us, they said to me, hey man, you need to go to college and become a physicist. You have a big head start. How can you understand this, you know, at this age, down there in those woods where you live eating? By the way, speaking of eating, <laughs> guess what I discovered in 2017? Armadillos carry leprosy. You know how many armadillos I cleaned and ate? Luckily, something like 96% of humanity is immune to leprosy, but holy cow, that was a close one. So, man. So anyway, 
They told me I should go to the, to, to, to the university to become a physicist. But what they didn't know is that I was already committed. So when it came time to choose what I was going to do in life, there really wasn't much choice. Because what am I going to do? Sell weed, get a job at Howard Industries, right? Work at Walmart? I have no idea. So what happens is one day the, the, the principal calls me to the office, which was like, you know, a not uncommon occurrence. You can tell I got a behavioral problem. So, <sighs> so <laughs> I am hilarious, I assure you. I, I, so what happens is the, uh, he calls me to his office and he says to me, now, now understand this, first of all, I was very good friends with both of his kids. I would go to his house. So when he was speaking to me, it was like he was speaking to his own child. It's Mr. Green, he come, calls me to the office and says, son, what are you doing after high school? I really had no plan, but I knew the right answer. I'm going to college. And he goes, really? How are you going to pay for it? And I go, well, I'm a good student and I'm a good musician. I'll get a scholarship. <laughs> and he responds, come to my office and let me introduce you to someone. And in there was a Navy recruiter, Senior Chief Gage. Senior Chief Gage sticks out his hand and he goes, how you doing, young man? You are so impressive, but look. The most I can offer you is $20,000 a year. I, I get it. It's 2022. Probably everybody in the room makes a little bit more than $20,000 a year. So let me translate what I just said, what I heard in 1983, so that you get the same impact in 2022. Look here, young man. The most I can offer you is $850 billion. I had heard my mother brag that my brother-in-law, who was like a low-level manager at the plant, which is as high as anybody could ever hope to, uh, to achieve in my community, she bragged that he had made 15000 in one year. And this dude just offered me 20000 a year? Then he tells me if I go nuke that I can get a $30,000 re-signing bonus after two years? I'm just like, oh, done, <laughs> say less. But this dude was one of the best things to happen to me. So I signed up for the Navy right after turning 17 years old. And now I still had a year of high school left, so I had to show up to work, go to the Navy recruiting station, spend time with Senior Chief Gage. So he starts telling me, dude, I'm going to get you in the Naval Academy. You're so impressive. And he had never done it before. We missed a deadline. He gets me into the nuke program, but then he finds this other program called BOOST, which stands for Broaden Opportunity for Officer Selection and Training. It was from people that were from rural America, inner city America, that had talent go into the military enlisted, and so they give you a year of hardcore military and academic training, and then give you an ROTC scholarship and you become an officer. So my dream was to be a nuclear officer in the Navy. I get there, and for the first time in my life, I'm properly diagnosed with a horrible skin problem I have, atopic dermatitis, which guess what? You're not allowed to be in the Navy with that. But the good thing is, the program I was in, that hardcore academic training I mentioned, in the mathematics, we were taken from arithmetic through calculus in one year. There were two classes, the regular class and the remedial class. Guess which one I was in? Thank you <laughs> for believing in me. <laughs> but I was in the remedial class. And because of the magic of social media, we have our Facebook group, Boost 8586, and they think it's hilarious that they were smarter than the astrophysicists. But anyway, <laughs> I learned algebra for the first time, and that is what allowed me to go to college. So I go home, and I had, now, please take no offense by what I'm about to say next. I had no vision for myself. And it certainly wasn't college. Why not? Because I knew you went to college to be one of four things. And here's why I become offensive. Number one, a teacher. I knew I didn't want to become a teacher. <laughs> that, that's OK? All right, yes. Oh, so I thought. Things have changed. An attorney definitely didn't want to be that. I don't know why, but they, you know, that was just taught, attorney bad. Medical doctor sounded like possible like, you know, president is possible. Probably not possible for me, right? Engineer, I have no idea what that even means. I know there's a cat that drives a train, but the college engineer, I don't even know what that is. So I go home, I'm aimless, and some of my buddies, they're like, dude, what are you doing? These are these guys from Chicago. You know, we call it up south. 
They, their parents move to Chicago, kids get, get, grow up, they get into gang problems, they send them back down to grandma where they terrorize us. Yeah, those are my pals. So Chris Mack and Ice. And you know what's funny? You know, we were like the DJ crew at Tougaloo. Ice is now a reporter in Selma, Alabama. He's like, this is George McDonald. I'm like, who? <laughs> Dude, you're Ice. You're not, jo I am George McDonald live. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, dude, if they only knew. All right, so um, basically, they're like, dude, you're wasting yourself. You're, you're a smart dude. You need to be in college. You need to do something with your life. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. I'm going to do something. Find a job. And they're like, look, man, come to Tougaloo, dude. It's chill. It's not like what you think. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. All right. They're like, it's five to one female to male. <laughs> Sign me up. Right? So I showed up to Tougaloo College not realizing I was supposed to apply first. <laughs> and they got me in. And my first summer, I'm homeless. And I end up, you know, not sleeping under the bridge in a tent homeless, right? Sleeping on your couch, sleeping on your floor, right? Make my way through the summer like that. And I ended up moving in with an insane guy, like literally insane, all right? I didn't tell that story in a book. It was there, but I had to remove it. But oh, Lord, never move in with an insane person. So, thank you. <laughs> She's thinking about her ex. So anyway, uh, I'm, she ain't got to tell me. <laughs> so anyway, my second summer, I'm there, and my year, I'm one of two physics majors, me and Lorenzen Dunbar. Lorenzen passed away, but Lorenzen was my angel. Lorenzen was amazing. He was like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, really skinny, very feminine. He was a gay guy, very feminine, but he was like, charisma like you wouldn't believe, right? And he was like telling me what to do, and I love people who tell me what to do. So the second su summer, I'm homeless again, but instead of moving in with a crazy person, I, I, I got an idea. I know that, you know, at Tougaloo, we, we only had one dorm that was used during the summers, right, for the summer science programs, upward bound, that kind of stuff, right? The others would be closed down, and the air conditioning would be off unless maintenance was working in it. And so I was like, yeah, here's what I'll do. I'll find the dorm maintenance is working in, break in the dorm, and sleep in a different part of the dorm that they're sleeping, that they're working in, right? And so I told the rinse my plan. I was sleeping in the, the, the dorm, and he comes and wakes me up early June. He's like, yo, wake up, man. He had a job at the admissions office. He's like, the University of Georgia called. They want your social security number. I know what you're thinking. There was no identity theft back then <laughs> that we knew about, right? So... I go to the admissions office and I call them and they're like, yes, you've been accepted to our summer research program and we want your check to be ready for you when you get here, so give us your social security number. I had no idea what they were talking about, but I know exactly what a check is. So I was like, five, 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 <laughs> five, 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 right? So I then go over to Kinslow Hall, our science building, and talk to that man, Dr. Richard McGinnis, who always has that smile. And I said to him, I was like, Professor McGinnis, I got this call, you know anything about this? He's like, oh, they accepted you. And I go, what is the deal? He's like, well, you know, they got their REU grant, research experience for undergraduates late in the year. They didn't have time to recruit, so they contacted people they knew and asked if they could recommend anyone, and I recommended you. And I said, well, you know what, Professor McGinnis, thank you so much, but it makes no difference. I don't have a car. I don't have any money, so there's no way for me to get to Athens, Georgia. Professor McGinnis reached into his own pocket and purchased me a Greyhound ticket to Athens, Georgia. All right? So I get there, and I'm working for this guy, Michael Duncan. He's a physical chemist. I'd never heard of research at this point in my life, okay? And as a matter of fact, let me tell you how bad I was. When I go to my first week of class at Tougaloo College, I go to my math class, and the professor goes to the board, starts talking and writing stuff, but he's not talking to nobody in particular. <laughs> and all the students are sitting at their desk writing stuff, and I'm looking around the room like, what the hell is going on in here? <laughs> what is everybody writing? How do they know what to write? And I don't. Was there an assignment? Like, I had never experienced note taking, right? So I was, you know, I was new. It was new to me, right? So anyway, I go to Michael Duncan, and here's what happens. He shows me around the lab, tells me what research the research group does, tells me what he expects me to do. Then he changes my life. <laughs> here's what happened. He, t he, he said to me, you know, 
us researchers, we keep strange hours, so you're gonna need access. You're gonna need a key to the building, you're gonna need a key to the lab, you're gonna need a key to my office. So I've looked around the room, and I've noticed that most of you are not African American. You should chuckle now, because <laughs> it's obvious. So, <laughs> and so in the recent years, you've become aware of certain phenomena that occur for your neighbors, like me. And one of them is, I'm held under suspicion a lot, and I'm never given trust, okay? And this dude just handed me the keys to the building. And I was like, <laughs> come again, white man? <laughs> like, you gave me the keys to the building? A lifetime of never being trusted ever and taught that you're the bad guy? And now you're going to hand me the keys to the building? I'm about to rob you blind. <laughs> Just kidding. I did not do that. What I did is I worked my tail off, and at the end of the summer, they were like, Hakeem, man, you're great at this. You should be a researcher. And I was like, oh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're judging me on the merit of my work? I was like, this research thing is the place to be. I want to do this. So I go back to Tugu College, drop out, and the reason why is, you know, something happened in the mid-'80s. That business my dad had got shut down, and a new product stormed the streets. And my father got involved, my brother got involved, and after a year, I got involved, all right? It was a crack cocaine epidemic. And so I had suffered a personal tragedy this, before I went to Athens, Georgia that summer. And to not feel, I decided to participate in that activity. By the time the early fall come around, I was addicted. And I go to Tougaloo College, and I am failing all of my classes, and so I drop out, because I know if I ever want to go to college, I can't have a transcript full of Fs for a semester. And I decide, OK, I need to leave this life. And I go get a job, the job I can get, which is a janitor at the nearby Ramada Renaissance Hotel. And I get my little ghetto apartment in Jackson. I'm making $4 an hour, barely get $100 a week, and just enough money to pay for gas in my apartment. So the way I would eat most days is I would come to work, walk the hallways, and when people order room service, they put the tray outside their door. And I would eat their leftovers, all right? But then my big break occurred. A bellhop got fired. And I'm like, if I get the bellhop job, I can get $100 in tips in a day. So I applied for the bellhop job. They're like, not you, dude. You're not at the front door. You're at the back door, right? And so I literally thought to myself, I can't go from janitor to bellhop? I'm going back to college. So I do exactly that. And just as I do, I'm in the dorm. Lorenzen comes and gets me. You need to get to the library. This woman was there. Her name is Dr. Cynthia McIntyre. She was about to complete her PhD in physics at MIT. She would be the second woman in history to do so. And she wanted to get other African Americans involved in physics and know about graduate school. So she got together her other graduate student colleagues, raised money from the deans at MIT, and they thought to themselves, where can we find the most undereducated, disenfranchised, no hope, Mississippi. So they came down, they visited Tougaloo, they visited Jackson State, they told us about this conference, the National Conference of Black Physicists. I went there, I met my mentor, the late, great Dr. Arthur Bertram Cuthbert Walker II. I ended up accepted in the Stanford University, Tell you a couple of quick stories about Stanford. There I am in my Stanford office. Still got a behavioral problem. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, what happens is, you know, you have course requirements and you have an exam requirement, the qualifying exam. You're tested over all of physics over the course of two days, eight hours a day, total of 16 hours. I took the exam and I failed it the first time. It's designed for about a third of the students to fail it every time because the passing grades are based on the grades achieved. So when I took it, 18 of us took it, five of us failed it. Two for the second time, three of us for the first time. It's held over your head as a threat. If you don't pass this, you're getting kicked out of the program. However, no one is ever kicked out of the program for not passing it. Why? Because you fail it the first time, you get a second try at a written exam. You fail that, you get an oral exam. You fail that, your, 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 your mentor, your PhD advisor, if they say, I want to keep the student, you stay. 
So what happens? When you fail it for the first time, you go talk to the head of the committee, who was Professor Bob Wagner. My two colleagues, they went and talked to him first. I said, hey, what did he say to you? And they said, oh, he said, why do you think you failed? Okay, study hard, you know, it's just formality. I'm like, okay, so I went to talk to him. Things went very different from me. He said, Hakeem, we looked at your case and we feel like you have three options. Option number one, maybe graduate school is not for you and you should drop out. Option number two, maybe graduate school is for you, but just not at Stanford and you should transfer. Option number three, you can stay and attempt to take the test again next year. We strongly recommend you take one of the first two options. What are you gonna do? I replied, take it again. To which he said, okay, well, the committee has a message for you they told me to deliver. Since you've already been here, when I got to, two, when I got to Stanford, they were like, look, dude, your background academically is not as strong as our regular student, so we recommend you take a year of, of undergraduate classes to catch up. I'm like, I don't think so. And he's like, no, 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 man. Listen, you know, our program is really tough. This will help you out a lot. We recommend you take this year of undergrad class. I'm like, nah, man, I don't think that's what I should do. And he's like, look, don't take it personally. Don't be offended. We're not saying you're not as good. I'm like, no, no, you misunderstand me. I need to take two years of undergraduate classes, <laughs> which is what I did. So what they said to me was, listen, you know, you've already been here four years. Typically, when the student drops out for not being good enough, they do it quickly. So here's our message to you. Number one, make sure you complete all the requirements for the master's degree this year. That way, when you fail next year, you won't leave here with nothing. And the second thing is, make sure you start applying for jobs now, because it takes a year to get employed at this level, and we want to make sure that when you fail again next year, you have somewhere to go. And I'm like, did this mofo just say, <laughs> fail again? So I go to take an exam again the second time, pass, and go on to make a lot of discoveries that you all are know and aware of. Like, for example, here we are in our 1994 rocket flight, the guy there in the white jacket, he is an Alabamian. That is Professor Richard Hoover. You always see him on Ancient Aliens if you watch that. That's the late great Art Walker there in the black shirt. That, that handsome guy, that's me. Um, here's our payload, the multispectral solar telescope array. Every hole you see there goes to a different telescope. And we pioneered taking pictures of the sun at different temperatures. Here's our data from those early days on film. Here's our high resolution data. And here's what you get every day from space now. We were the first to do it. So when you think of these technologies, when you see this, these images, think Dr. Art Walker. And here I am. So what happens to me is while, you remember that thing about I don't want to be a teacher? Well, guess what? While I'm teaching grad, while I'm teaching, people keep telling me the same thing over and over and over and over again. While I'm teaching grad, at grad students, when I'm in Silicon Valley, working at a company, teaching a, 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 a class at night, when people see me on television, everybody always comes and tells you the same thing. Hakeem, I thought I was dumb till I saw you. So I realized I had some sort of superpower to teach people. So it became a responsibility to me. So I do it around the world. Uh, there I am in Tanzania. That woman right there with the globe under her arm, her name is, her name is Susan Moravina. She was an accountant working in Kenya. And she would do this cosmos education thing with us in the summers. And she came to me and said, hey, Hakeem, I brought it to Ghana in 2006. The guy in the yellow is, is uh, Alphonse Sterling. He's my uh, NASA colleague. But at the end of this event, we were there observing the total solar eclipse from, from Ghana in 2006. She said, Hakeem, I want to get into the world of astronomy. Can you mentor me into the world of astronomy? I'm like, hell yeah, Susan. So <laughs> she's now an international superstar of astronomy. And I also in in introduced her and her husband. That wasn't my intention. But Chu and Susan, I knew Chu, I knew Susan. Hey, Chu. She was like, man, I'm trying to do this project in Africa. I'm like, I got the perfect person for you. Little did I know, the woman here in green, her name is Samaya Farid. She's from southern Alabama. We used to always, she came and worked for me as an undergraduate. She was a student at Alabama A&M University. We used to have these debates over who's more country. She's right across from me in, the Alabama, in Alabama, whereas my high school graduating class was 70. Hers was 20, all right? So Samaya comes and works for me. I'm like, girl, you got the it factor. I can't wait to see what you're going to do in this world. Fast forward four years, she graduated a couple years earlier. I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, and I just randomly run into her in a, in, a, in a parking lot. And I'm like, what are you doing, Samaya? Expecting to hear something amazing. She was working retail. 
And the reason why is she had younger siblings and her parents, for whatever reason, were unable to take care of them. And so she had to get the job she could get immediately, and that's what she got. And I'm like, hell no, Samaya. You're going to re-enroll as a graduate student. You're going to be my graduate student, and we're going to get this done. So we were there in Ghana getting the data for her master's thesis. Today, she's Dr. Samaya Farid at Yale, right? And so here are some more of my students. We went to this island of Mongaya in 2010, almost died three times. This dude is from Monk's Corner, Alabama. Anyway, another country boy. Here we are in South Africa, worked in South Africa to help them make their students, and it worked. And uh, I, I do this for other nations. I go around the world helping people develop their science education as well as their space programs. So here is for the Netherlands and South Africa. Here is for the US Department of State in Algeria. Here I am in, uh, right before the pandemic. And, and, um, but anyway, y'all solve the impossible. My life was the impossible. Y'all solved me. And I know together what I found is we can do anything. And one of the things that drives me crazy, I mean, literally, we could be Star Trek tomorrow, right? If we were trusting and trustworthy. And one of the things that drives me crazy is we're not. But anyway, I'm going to leave you on this. Sound. Mark Vandehei, Alexander Mazurkin, and Joe Acaba lifting off and now on their way to the International Space Station. I'm NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei on the International Space Station orbiting 250 miles above our planet. And it's great to be a part of American Graduate Day. I've been fortunate to have had great mentors in my life during both my Army and academic careers. In fact, while at Stanford University studying for a Master's in Applied Physics, one of the people who helped me along the way was Dr. Hakeem Olusei. Hello, Hakeem. Houston Station on Space to Ground 3. NASA is a wondrous blend of science, engineering, technology, with mentors at every step of the way. So become a mentor, just like Hakeem was for me. Oh, I missed it. Whoa, help me. <laughs> Mark was just stuck in space. Y'all saw that? Yeah, he just came down. Thank you all so much. And now, thank you. thank you. I don't think I'm, I'm on yet. All right, this thank is you mine. so much. Thank you. Yes, 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 please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Olashe, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's so inspiring. I've read A Quantum Life, so if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. Um, so we polled some of our audience members, and we have yes. a few questions that we'd like to ask you. I think they'll resonate with everybody. So your journey has been incredible, from poverty to Stanford, everything that you just shared. Can you share the most significant moments or points in your educational or professional journey? Like, what was the most significant thing? Yeah, so you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm happy you asked that because, you know, we're all mentors. I'm a mentor, you're, you're, you're mentors. And what I've seen is that quite often, just like with me, a person reaches a critical point, and if you get them beyond that critical point, right, where they're gonna go off their journey, then you can move them forward. Um, and, and, or, you know, you can have that inspirational moment like I had at University of Georgia. Right, that moment of just like boom. So for the guys that I showed you that we were on the island, that moment was for one of those guys, Dave Chesney, that sort of moment. And what did he do? Go on to create the world's fastest iron propulsion technology. So it's that, that one moment gets you over like whatever you might be experiencing, the challenges coming your way, but something yeah, just yeah. pushes you forward. Absolutely, so for example, when I was at Stanford my second quarter, I take midterm exams, and I get the lowest score on every midterm in every class. And I'm like, okay, I'm clearly not good enough, right? So I go to my uh, academic advisor's office, Walter Meyerhoff, but he's not there. So I just sit on the floor in front of his office. Now next door to him is Doug Oshroff, Nobel Prize winner for superfluidity of, of uh, helium-4. He goes back between his office and his lab, sees me sitting there, and he goes, What's, what's, what's going on? I tell him I'm waiting for Walter, and he's like, well, well, and I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking about dropping out. He's like, why? I'm like, I'm not smart enough. He's like, why do you think that? I'm like, well, I just took, he's like, okay, what are you doing in this class? And he has me go to the board and actually do problems, 
and I do all the problems he, he gives me, and he's like, you seem pretty smart to me, just stick around, right? That was the one moment I was thinking of dropping out, right? And so had I met Walter rather than Doug, maybe things would have turned out differently. I don't know. So I guess for our teacher audience, you never know the words that you're going to share with students, the impact that they're going to have on their future. Absolutely. But you know, the other thing that I do realize, too, is that the naysayers propelled me forward as well, right? Because I would always think to myself, oh, really? I'll show you, right? That was maybe a stronger motivator than, you know, encouragement for me. And so that's been one of my struggles as a leader, right? Like, who needs encouragement versus who needs a kick in the pants, right? Sure. It's hard <laughs> to tell the difference sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So we know you face numerous impossible tasks, all of the technology and things that you've engineered oh, yeah. over time. How do you approach situations that seem impossible at first? What's your problem solving process? Center and have faith. <laughs> because I'm telling you, you're right, they're impossible. Like, you know, when, I, when you first joined the world of physics and they're like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You're like, we are? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're going to build the world's most perfect sphere. Then we're going to measure how the Earth drags space-time as it rotates. <laughs> you know, it's like, really? I'll tell you, my, one, of my, one of my early rotations in research was with Doug Oshroff, the guy I mentioned. Um, and so he, he works in superfluid helium. And he, this is exactly how the meeting went. I go to the meeting. He goes, yeah, I work in superfluid helium. You know what a superfluid is? Okay, here. Here's what it is. Okay, now. Here's a book on superfluid. I want you to build me a third sound resonance detector. All right, see you. <laughs> a what? <laughs> no instructions. No instructions. I'm like, the sound you said? Yeah, like, no, no, third sound. I'm like, third sound? <laughs> you know, it is like, yeah. I never went back and I still have the book. <laughs> so just center yeah. and move forward. Yeah, center, move forward. Everything is the same, right? It's one step at a time. Be careful. Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. So, you know, we teach kids across the state of Tennessee, and there are lots of students in our classrooms every day that are struggling and experiencing some of the same things that you shared in yeah. your talk. What advice would you give those students? Educate their parents. Okay. Bring them on board. <laughs> well, let me tell you why I say that, right? So my son, who I mentioned, this kid completed, I homeschooled him up to age 10. He completed Algebra 1 at 7, Algebra 2 and Trig at 9, started Calculus at 10. He could read like an adult at three and a half because of his sister, not me. Not me or his mother, his sister. And so at like four or five or something, my mother says to me, you know, I think he's smarter than you are. <laughs> to which I reply, you know, no the hell he ain't. <laughs> of course, I didn't say hell to my mother, but I was like, his daddy got a PhD in physics. Neither one of my parents graduated high school. And so I think we all, we make a mistake to always think the kids, the kids, the kids. Who are the kids learning from every day? You're six years old by the time you get into, by the time you step into a uh, school building. First, first mm -hmm. grade, right? That's, you're, you know, you're six years old. And, and so when I got to Stanford and I heard these other cats describing what their life was like of education, I was like, I was blown out of the water before this race started, you know? Yeah. And, and what matters most, so I've come to learn that you learn, especially mathematics well, by the time you graduate high school, that happens in one of two ways. Either it's in your family, community, something like that, or you're lucky. That's it. The whole idea of, oh, I'm gonna take a Hakeem, you know, whose parents didn't graduate high school, and he's gonna ace calculus by the time, you know, th there's ways of thinking. You know, like for example, my son says to me in, at some point in middle school, Dad, in math class, I feel like a god among peasants. Oh my god. <laughs> and I was like, that's a damn problem. You see, that hubris is going to get you in trouble. You got a head start, but they're working. So, but, it, you know, it's true. You know, if you get your thinking done right, you get these fundamentals done right. So, for example, I was in shock when I got to Stanford, you know, that at Tougaloo, even though it was a whole lecture thing, they at least started with the idea, you don't know this, so I'm going to teach it to you. Right? That never happened at Stanford. It was kind of like, hey, since you know this, let me give you some deep, obscure stuff that you're completely not going to understand, <laughs> right? And so I'm like, oh, I get it. The biggest skill you need to learn is how to teach yourself, right? That's what, and so advice. luckily, I happen to be, I learned this word from a comedian. I happen to be an autodidact. Okay. <laughs> yeah, teach yourself. Yeah, I teach myself. I'm like, I'm like, a what? He's like, you're an autodidact, aren't you? 
like, a, I'm a what? I, don't, I self something? I do something to myself? This was on Neil deGrasse Tyson's That's right. Star Talk. I watched That's that. right. Yeah, Chuck, yeah. Knight. Chuck Knight said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have heard the stuff he said off camera. Anyway. <laughs> well, we won't go there. So <laughs> all in, clean, all clean. <laughs> but hilarious. In your memoir, there were so many inspiring moments. I think, you know, for myself as a teacher, but also as a parent. Because yeah. I have a, a child with a learning disability yeah. who wanted to go into electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I am ashamed to say I did try to discourage him because I wasn't sure he could make it. And he's about to graduate, so I was completely wrong. Completely wrong. Wonderful. But nice, nice, nice. When I was reading that, it really made me think about my biases. Yeah. So, and how I encourage those young learners. Right. So, right. what advice do you have for our educator audience? Well, first thing is, you know, what you guys do, I mean, come on. It, it is so tough. It's so much tougher than what I do. I go into a university classroom, they all pay to be there. Okay? You guys, you know, you, got, I, you know, it's it, like, what was the question? <laughs> What advice do you have for teachers when you're thinking about how to encourage young you know, people? You know, so I think two things, right? So the first two things I think in every situation is break down barriers and make real human connections, right? It's and about so building relationships. It's absolutely. It's about, it's about so for example, I'll give an example. When we did this project in South Africa, you know, it was funny because among the black astronomers of America, the long-standing joke has been, Hakeem is the only black astronomer who you can tell is black on the phone. <laughs> All right? And it was a self-criticism for how we have to do better about, you know, but, but listen, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're white, you're not, you know, what percentage of people are becoming physicists, right? It's very tiny. No matter where you're from, no matter what community you're from, it's a tiny fraction of people, and they're from, like, better off economically, right? But anyway, when this guy at, here in Tennessee... He lives in Nashville, but he's a professor at Western Kentucky University. Charles Magruder got this idea to help South Africa make black astronomers, right? Um, we got a grant from the Kellogg Foundation. I knew when I went in there, he recruited me because he's like, Hakeem, you understand the problem because you're the only one who came from that background and made it, right? So, and you know as well as I, the problem is not one of academics. And so I knew when I went in there to talk to those students, they were gonna see me as some fancy American guy, not like them, right? So I'm like, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to tell y'all on day one what you think every day, but dare not tell another person. And I know it because I went through it too. And it's the phenomenon of you're from this poor environment or this undereducated environment, and you go away to a top university, which for them was the University of Cape Town. And at home, they're like, our hero, Hakeem, he's up there in San for kicking butt. But your dark secret is you go there, and they're like, they let you in? You're not one of us. Get out of here, right? And so, you, you know, you hold that in your heart. And then there's all these different uh, cultural things. Like, for example, they would talk, you know, they would open up and talk to me about, like, yeah, where I'm from, like in Mississippi, when you drive by on the road, you pass another car, what happens? You wave, you wave right? Every yeah. time. So these cats are coming from, like, rural America, I mean, rural South Africa. They come to the big school. They're like, yeah, I walk down the hallway. Somebody looks me right in the eye. I speak, and they say nothing, and I feel like a fool, you know? Little things like that. When I showed up at Stanford, I didn't dress right, I didn't look right, I didn't talk right. In fact, let me tell you a funny story. First day of classes, first week of classes, I'm going to my quantum mechanics class, taught by Mason Yearian. Before, uh, people before the professor comes in, students talk, and there's a murmur of voices. And I was surprised when I got to Stanford because it was wooded. I expected this urban jungle type thing, right? So I turn to this guy and I go, hey man, yet again the same topic. You see all these squirrels on campus? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I go, how come nobody eats them? <laughs> the room went silent. Yeah. Everybody looks at me. I'm like, hey, when you ain't had no squirrel and dumplings, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> but you know that, you know, there's those cultural differences. And so, you know, you never know when someone steps into your classroom what they're dealing with. And I'm, and I'm gonna tell you this too, you know, when I first started teaching, I became, when I was working in Silicon Valley, I became a professor at a junior college, Foothill Community College, right? And, you know, my personality has always been very warm, welcoming, open. And so a lot of students would come to me and tell me their personal problems. And it made me aware of how naive I had been about the world, about, you know, what's going on in people's homes, because it was like, Egad, clutch my pearls, you know, <laughs> day after day after day. I was just, I just couldn't believe, you know, what I was hearing, that 
you know, because I, you know, I'm a scientist, so I start thinking, doing statistics. If this is my sample, what is that? How does that translate to society? You know, so people are going through it in their homes, and you know, we have no idea. So, you know, the only way we can reach them is, act, is if we actually connect. You know, right. but you know, sometimes we find ourselves playing defense, right? Because, you know, I don't know about you guys, how often occurs in K through 12, but let me tell you, insane people show up in college classrooms all the time. And I, when I say insane, I mean, like, I've been stalked three times. I've had three different stalkers. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what I think I'm, I'm hearing you say is Four, one. Four, now that I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> one was like a stalker light. Yeah. It's all about building the relationships and helping kids feel like they belong in those situations, building that STEM identity. Oh, yeah. And all of these teachers here oh, yeah. have oh, the yeah. ability to do that. Yeah, identity is so, thank you for that. That's what I attack is identity. So while I'm doing academics, I'm attacking their identity, right? I'm, who, because, you know, I acted out what, the, what I thought the world told me I'm supposed to be, right, when you're young. You know, you, you know how it is. You gotta be 50 till you get any sense in this world as a dude. As a girl, you know, it happens at like four. But, you know. <laughs> That was a little bit of a uh, pandering. <laughs> well, any final thoughts? Thank you all. I, you know, honestly, guys, you guys are Earth's mightiest superheroes. What you do as educators, and I literally would have gotten nowhere without you. And, you know, please take it as seriously as I do. You know, smile and the world smiles with you. Share your enthusiasm. Go out there, change those lives. And I know you get it, too. Hey, Dr. O, you might not remember me, but... Yep. Yeah, love those, right? And, and that's what you're doing every day. So keep it up. We're back. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Dr. Akeem Olashe, everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.